Hello there, welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earlier crimes. But before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. So I am, or I have stamped previously this um, Picket Fence Studios Santa Claus is Coming to Town stamp on um, two times on a half sheet of 80 pound cardstock. Um, these are Christmas cards made for a friend who purchases her Christmas cards from me. And I'm just going to color the two Santas on this sheet while we talk about our crime. A little bit about the coloring. I am starting with the lightest color going to the darkest color, leaving the reds for last because reds bleed. I would not want to be have the red colored and then go in to color his beard or the fur on the edges of his coat and pull all that red into the gray or the white. It's white. When I am coloring those furry parts and his beard, it's going to look very, very gray. When you're coloring white, you need to leave, you need to add the shadows and then you need to leave white space. I'm using toner, um, the T family, the toner gray family for all of the whites on these Santa Clauses. And I do leave white space, but it's going to look gray until I get that red in. The red, I am using five colors, I think. Let me count. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five colors. One is actually a dark violet to deepen the shadows. And then the lightest is simply to glaze over and help that blend to look more seamless. The artist of this stamp has done a really good job of drawing in the shadows, so I just need to emphasize that. I will not be making a complete card today. We're just doing some coloring and talking about some crime. And with that said, let's go ahead and jump into the crime. Our alphabetical journey today takes us back to the state of Georgia. Now, Georgia was the first episode last year that we started talking about how they became a state. But I don't think we talked about some funny things or fun things about Georgia. So Georgia has one of the world's largest aquariums. It's called the Georgia Aquarium. <laughs> Coca-Cola was invented in Georgia. Atlanta is the fifth state capital of Georgia. Georgia is the USA's largest peanut producer. The first gold rush actually occurred in Georgia. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. There are 383 species of birds that live in Georgia. Or who counted those? Who counted those? <laughs> Georgia had the first college in the world to accept women as students. Georgia was the first state to lower the voting age to 18 and was one as last of the original 13 colonies. The phrase sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite originated in Georgia supposedly. Um, most of the lakes in Georgia are artificial. Cordelia or Cordial, Georgia is the watermelon capital of the world. And Franklin County, Georgia is the location of what was reported as the dastardly deed. So obviously today our story is um, in Franklin County, Georgia, and we are going to time travel back to the mid 1800s. Now, Franklin County was actually named after Benjamin Franklin and was established in 1784. And it was one of the first counties established in Georgia by its state constitution. One early resident to Franklin County was Major James McConnell Montgomery. James moved to, into the area near the Chattahoochee River and acquired a thousand acres in about 1821. His thousand acres of land was on both sides of the river, so he created a private ferry. And it was, for a very long time, the only pl place in that area that you could cross the Chattahoochee River. It remained a privately owned ferry until December um, of 1873, when James was granted a state franchise that was coincidentally, or not, signed by his friend, the governor of Georgia, Governor Gilmer. As I said, this was the only place for traffic to cross on the main road between Atlanta and Marietta 
until the 1870s, and it ran and was open consistently with the exception of during the war. Um, Martin DeFore was born on the 17th of September, 1805, in Franklin, Georgia. His father was James, and his mother was Elizabeth, and they had 16 children, six of which died at birth or very shortly thereafter. Martin was the second of their children and their first son. Susan, Susanna Tabor was born on the 2nd of December of 1798, also in Franklin, Georgia. Her father was John Tabor Jr., and her mother was also Elizabeth. And Susanna was six of their seven children. When Martin and Susanna met, Susanna was a few years older than Martin, but they courted and fell in love and were married on September 14th of 1830, again in Franklin County, Georgia. They were the parents of five daughters. Um, James, Martin, Susanna, and the fairy all come together in one of Georgia's oldest unsolved crimes. And given that it's the mid 1800s, maybe even the oldest unsolved crime. In 1853, Martin and Savannah picked up their family and moved to the Bolton neighborhood in Atlanta, Georgia. And Martin took over the operation of what had become the Montgomery Ferry, named after Captain James Montgomery. And he took over the operation of that ferry. And he named it or renamed it the DeForest Ferry because, you know, it was his now. <laughs> they lived in the home that James had originally built when he opened, when he purchased the land and opened the ferry. Um, as Martin and, Su and Susanna's daughters grew up, they settled close to the, in the areas close to the ferry. But by 1879, three of their five daughters had passed away. One passed away just a year after moving to the ferry. Martin and Susanna lived a quiet life in their community. They were respectable citizens. They were liked by those around them. And quite honestly, nobody could think of anyone who had any reason to dislike them. That is, until the morning of July 26, 1879. At 6 o'clock in the morning, on that summer morning, Martin Walker a grandson who lived across the street from Martin and Susanna noticed that his grandparents' house was still remarkably still and quiet. It seemed that they hadn't gone up for the day, and this was unusual. And knowing that his grandparents were aging, young Martin, I'm going to call him that even though he was an adult because he has the same name as his grandpa, young Martin went across the street to check on his grandparents and to see if they needed anything. They were not young and he, you know, he was doing his, he was doing right by his grandparents. So young Martin walked around to the house and noticed that the back door was unlocked. And I'm guessing a jar um, because he noticed it by sight. He entered the home and went into the, so the house had two bedrooms on the main floor and then other bedrooms upstairs. And the grandparents slept in one of those main floor bedrooms. And so young Martin went toward the bedroom that he knew his grandparents occupied, and what he found was a crime scene. Now, Martin and, Su and Susanna were lying in bed, having been murdered in their sleep with an axe that was still leaning up next to the um, fireplace. The axe was covered in blood, and there was fire ash from the axe on the victim's. The scene was so gruesome that the New York Times called it, quote, the most shocking tragedy which ever occurred in this county. Obviously, the most important thing for the community was to discover who and why this murder had occurred. Martin and Susanna were well loved and no one could think of anyone, any reason someone would have to hurt them or want them dead. Robbery was suggested as a motive when it was noticed that the dresser drawer was broken and Martin's wallet was missing. But a bag of, of silver, it was a small bag that held about $18 in silver, which was not a small amount of money then, about $554 now, was not taken. So robbery could not have been a motive if that much money was left behind. The only other thing missing from the house were a pair of Martin's boots, 
but they were later found in the woods not far from the home next to the seeds and the rind of a mostly eaten watermelon. And while the crime scene was horrible, the evidence that the killer or killers had hung around inside the DeFore home was equally chilling. Evidence showed that those involved in the crime had hidden in an upstairs bedroom. The bed had been slept in. The window had been opened, um, presumably from the outside. And muddy footprints indicated that someone had climbed in through that window and walked across the floor. They even used the adjoining wood room as an outhouse or a bathroom. So like the house had a room upstairs for wood to feed the upstairs fireplaces. Yeah. The culprits had even eaten some of the bread and milk in the home. The murder weapon that had been found in Martin and Susanna's bedroom had been outside next to the wood pile and bare footprints showed that someone had gone outside to retrieve the ax and bring it inside for the murder. With robbery being ruled out as the motive and no other motive being easy to come by, the focus shifted then to the who. Maybe once they figured out who had done it, they could figure out why it was done. It was early on assumed that the murderer must have been, an, been acquainted with the house and the habits of the er elderly couple, which clearly leads to the impression that this was a crime of passion. Suspicion focused heavily on traveling vagrants or, you know, um, groups of homeless people who just traveled back and forth along the river, including two that had reportedly been denied lodging at the DeBoer home the night before the murder. An article in the July 30th newspaper warned of, quote, the danger of tramps, end quote, and drew a clear connection between the homeless and the DeBoer murders, claiming they skulk through the country like wolves, only harmless when gutted, gathering in gangs whenever there is crime to be committed or whenever there is a taint of blood in the air, end quote. Sorry for my gravelly voice this morning. It's early and it's chilly and I'm still a little thirsty from the nighttime, I guess. I don't know. My throat's a little dry. Anyway, clearly people were outraged and looking for answers, even wrong ones. With great detail, newspapers described the hunt for the murderer in the case of Martin and Susanna DeFore. Bloodhounds were brought in by the police in, hoping, in hopes of finding a trail leading to who done it. Well, these quote, and I'm using air quotes here, you can see my fingers going, trained dogs led the police to an African-American man named Asa Gunn. Asa was in his mid-twenties, and as soon as the bloodhounds stopped near him, the police were certain they had, his, had their man. Asa was tried for the murder of the elderly couple, although there was no evidence that he had committed the crime, and he was not given the services of a lawyer. Under the threat of hanging, because this is the South in the 1800s, and Asa is not white, um, the police continued to bully him toward a confession, and eventually he did. He confessed to having murdered Martin and Susanna. However, while he was waiting trial, he wrote a letter to a young lawyer named Frank Har Harrelson, Har Harrelson um, and he was begging for help. He told Frank that he was innocent and he hadn't committed the crime, and he Assumedly told him about the police's tactics and threatening to have him hung or lynched if he didn't confess. But Frank stepped in as a defense attorney for Asa. And there were actually a lot of residents in the area who also felt that he was not the man. They did not believe, they knew him and did not believe that he had anything to do with the murders of Martin and Susanna. Um, at one point he was actually convicted based upon his forced confession. But with his attorney's help and community support, that verdict was overturned and he was acquitted. The desire to convict Asa seems to have been a combination of the color of his skin, 
um, his location. And the prosecution's, sorry, that word did not come out right, prosecution's desire to put an end to the case and restore what peace could be found again in the community. And quite possibly there was something even uglier there, but who knows? However, in the end, Asa did receive his freedom, but still the murder of Martin and Susanna wasn't resolved. And were there ever any other suspects? In June of 1883, nearly four years after the murders took place, another newspaper headline read, quote, the perpetrators of the dastardly, dastardly deed caught, end quote. This article went on to explain how Joe Johnson confessed to the slayings. He claimed that he and two other men had committed the murders. There was speculation among the residents of the town that there would soon be a hanging. And it came out, though, that Joe, well, he was a liar, 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 pants on fire. He wanted to be famous or infamous, whatever he could be, in order to get his 15 minutes. And he banked on the fact that there was no evidence that could convict him. So he just kind of was, yep, I did it, prove it, you know, that kind of thing. So there wasn't a hanging. There was no conviction. Not then and not ever. Joe's confession actually just collapsed when the police began to actually investigate his claim and his, you know, evidence that he had been there. And eventually the DeFore murder case came to a dead end. The murder of Martin and Susanna is still in 2023 listed as unsolved. And it seems that this crime was so horrible at the time that people were shook to the core and yet no one was able to be convicted. People were so shook to the core that the house that Martin and Susanna um, lived in and had been killed in was demolished just a few weeks after their murder, it didn't even, yeah, it didn't stay. So the one thing about this case that I find intriguing that I could not find answers to was, were the family ever suspects? In all of the things that I read, neither their two remaining adult daughters their husbands, nor the grandson that found them were ever listed as having been suspects. Normally, in a case of what seems to be a murder of passion, or, you know, as this case seems to have been, it has to be somebody who has emotions involved, right? And... Emotions run hot in families. <laughs> I'm not saying I've ever wanted to eliminate one of my siblings, but the only people I've ever punched with a closed fist I'm blood related to. So <laughs> there's that. But yeah, there was nothing in any of the um, newspaper articles or um, um, stories that I read that indicated that the family was ever suspected. And so the, the, passion part of this crime has to have been in the motive, whatever that was. And if it was truly that somebody had wanted to sleep there that night and had been turned out, maybe it really was the traveling vagrants who came in and, and just savagely um, attacked and killed the DeFores. I don't know. I am, I'm actually stumped by this one. Another unfortunate element to this story is that because this is Georgia in the post-Civil War, in the rebuilding of the South, um, a lot of things, records, are not necessarily um, intact. Um, Atlanta was the fifth capital of the state. Um, and it just, you know, the Civil War wrecked havoc on the infrastructure of the, of the country. And so there's not a lot of consistency in record keeping. Like, for example, I could not find record of um, 
what Martin and Susanna did as a livelihood prior to taking over the running of the ferry. I would guess as, as they ran the ferry, that was their livelihood. The money that they collected for that would have been how they supported their family. But I couldn't find any record of what they did prior to that. Did they um, run a farm? Did they have a store? That kind of thing. So the records of the case are also a little bit um, slim. The, um, the details are, are kind of not there. And that's unfortunate. And it's not you know likely that at this point in 2023 that, you know, what is that? 200 years later, well, 150 years later, something like that, that we're going to find out who killed Martin and Susanna. But yeah, it kind of just makes me, it makes me think like, what were the, other than obvious racial bias and um, accusing the first person of color that the dogs stopped to sniff. Um, other than that, what were the, the investigative techniques used? You know, I don't know. I'm stumped by this one. I would have thought there would have been some um, questioning of family members. <laughs> I don't know, but it's not the only thing listed is that they were, that Martin and Susanna were well liked, that people loved them, that they were upstanding members of the community, that nobody had any reason to dislike them. So their murder was troubling on multiple levels just because of that fact. So I don't know. Um, this one is a, it's, it's, a, it's a stumper. And it's also short on detail. But, you know, um, Back to the coloring for just a minute. Once I had everything colored, I did add some highlight details to the eyes and the boots with a white gel pen. And I added some shimmery glitter to the gold bell and the gold buckle. And then I went back and decided to add the shimmery glitter to the fluff on his pants and the fluff on his um, Santa jacket. I really wish that the um, Wink of Stella pen um, photographed and videoed a little bit better because in real life it is just like the perfect amount of glitter for a Santa suit. But anyway, that is the unfortunate story of the death of Martin and Susanna DeFore, the unsolved case of their death. I'm curious to hear about your thoughts. Leave me a comment down below. Tell me what you think about this case. What are, what are, your, what are your first thoughts? I was able to find a photograph of Martin and Susanna taken in their later years before their death. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. I hope you enjoyed our story. I've added a couple of other videos here for you to watch as well as that subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below. Give me a thumbs up and have a really fabulous day.